episode 199 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Regeneration in Zebrafish with Dr. Ken Haas. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have the esteemed scientist, Dr. Ken Poss from none other than Duke University. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on the regeneration of tissues in zebrafish. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news coming up. But first, are you on social media? Should you be? Should Daylon be? Watch Stem Cell Technologies' Christina McBurney, Manager of Scientific Communications, and Leanna Bedell, Manager of Social Media, discuss how you can use social media as a scientist to advance your scientific career in an on-demand webinar. Learn more at www.stemcell.com slash social media. My man, I'm on anti-social media, which is I'm the <laughs> lurking. So I just lurk. I just look at other people's posts. All right. So don't tell me what to do. Um, you know, th- this episode is a little bit uh, outside of our comfort zone. You know, we're talking about endogenous stem cells and regenerative processes um, that were there, you know, not, not grown in a dish from pluripotent stem cells. And I'm excited about that for one. Uh, for the roundup, I'm going to kick off with a study that's also outside of our comfort zone in terms of models. We usually like to go with the mice or the organoids or something here. I'm talking about the worm, not even a vertebrate. Um, but this is, I think, a story that really uh, it shows the power of engineering uh, when applied to systems biology. And I think there's a lot of lessons from this that we can apply in vertebrates, even maybe humans. Um, so this is a story, like I said, it's about the worm, and it's based on this idea that, you know, all developmental biologists, the holy grail really is to understand how this single cell zygote uh, differentiates into all the specialized cell types that make up the tissues and organs of an or- uh, organism's body. Um, and in nematode or in C. elegans, nematode, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a boon because the entire cell lineage has been totally mapped. There's not that many cells to begin with, so you can map them right down to the one. Um, And so it's a a really robust model for elucidating embryogenesis at, you know, both single cell resolution, but also on like the system level. Um, And while the the system is very potent, uh, there's still a lot to be learned, of course, you know, just because we know where all the cells go, we don't necessarily understand all the networks and signaling apparatus, transcription factors, et cetera, that orchestrate the process, right? Well, come in to this with the the new genome engineering and reporters, which have long been used, right? Um, But the the resolution of these has gotten better in the diversity of fluorophores, uh, now that we're doing the live imaging and high resolution, real time, very short intervals. Um, but still, the methods are kind of restricted in that you can only look at a few genes at a time. All right, so that's where this powerhouse study from Zhuo Du uh, from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Uh, the group came in with like a just comprehensive approach. They, they went with a protein atlas that encompasses a dynamic expression of, so it's live reporters that encompass expression of hundreds of transcription factors um, in pretty much all the cells that, that emerge during uh, C. elegans embryogenesis. And uh, they did this using uh, protein fusion reporters, uh, high resolution microscopy real time and direct lineaging, which is you know, quantitative approaches to structure these, uh, these events. Um, so, I mean, it was like a, a, a technical, this is a nature methods story, but it, it was, it was, you know, big time in the scope. Um, and I think it wasn't just the tools, uh, they actually use the system and, and identify this unique and unexpected role for this, um, skin specifier in neurogenesis. And they also, uh, uh, discovered a critical function of this uncharacterized tr- transcription factor in convergent muscle differentiation. So they developed this tool, which was comprehensive that other people can then build on 
Um, and then critically, uh, that's why I made it into nature methods, not just a tech paper, but some insight too. Uh, they demonstrate the utility of the tool to identify and elucidate really key and novel principles of embryogenesis um, that maybe can glean or give some insight into the systems uh, at play during early embryogenesis or all of embryogenesis uh, in the worm. So pretty cool, lower, lower model, but very high, high power. Yeah, it's going to be a, a repeated topic in this particular episode of the podcast. We're talking about model systems, non-traditional model systems, perhaps. You know, we're going to talk about the zebrafish with Dr. Poss down the road. And here we're talking about C. elegans, which has been a workhorse in developmental biology for, for years now. I actually first learned about it in my undergrad at Duke, go Blue Devils. Uh, the power of the, zebra, the C. elegans is in part, you know, every single cell in that organism has been mapped. Okay, you know, and there's not many of them, it's like a few thousand cells in the C. elegans, right, for when it becomes an adult. So over the years, every single cell in the C. elegans has been mapped, and we know how these different cells move about during development and what they turn into. And this is really taking that to the next level. We are using spatial temporal omics and development uh, imaging, really high-powered imaging here, to figure out how these transcription factors are influenced influencing cell dynamics, cell fate decisions. Um, this is, yeah, it's building on years of work from the C. elegans. And we talk about this a lot on the show. This is the era of spatial temporal omics, right? Maybe five years ago, it was just about single cell and figuring out individual cells and where they're moving about in a population. But now you can really bring in that dynamic of time. You can bring in that time element. That's why this is considered a 4D paper, right? So we're living in this new era, the era of spatiotemporal omics, right, Dylan? Yes, it's exciting. I mean, but for me, this was even, this went kind of next level because the big rage now is, yeah, the spatial transcriptomics, um, where you can get a kind of global view of all the transcripts on, on a spatial, spatial overlay. Um, but this is one of those things where it's like, oh, well, if you wanted to look at 300 factors, or if you wanted to look at all the transcription factors in the, in, the, in the worm, you'd have to label every single one of them. And that's just not practical. Yeah, yeah well, apparently it is practical. <laughs> um, it just takes a monumental effort. And that for me was a takeaway from this is I was, I was like, getting anxious just thinking about all the the work um so i mean very impressive my hats off and i, I don't know what you do where you go from here but uh, congratulations because uh, you built you know a lot of a lot of careers can be made uh with this tool you know a lot of stories can be built out of this uh pretty comprehensive and massive system so very nice work congratulations to you as well do yeah absolutely i can see how this would become a staple of the C. elegans field. Anytime you want to look at cell development or whatever, you can refer back to this Atlas paper, right? And the next step is to see if you can transition some of these approaches into another organ system, or organism or organ system, perhaps. Uh, not going to be the work coming out of this lab, perhaps, since this is probably a C. elegans focused lab, but you can see the next step. So moving on away from these beautiful model systems, just for a little bit, we're going to go back to the zebrafish in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to shift to a cell stem cell story, which is talking about the lysosome, traditionally known as the trash can, the trash can of the cell. But there's more to it than that, apparently. So the title of this paper is TFEB Mediated Endolysosomal Activity Controls Human Hematopoietic Stem Cell Fate. First author is Laura Garcia Pratt, and this is coming from the, the lab of the one and only Dr. John Dick. Um, and we're talking about the lysosome, as I mentioned, it's traditionally known as the trash can of the cell. That's what you learn about in your basic biology courses. Uh, but it apparently has a really important role in regulating hematopoietic stem cell fate and quiescence in particular. We want to know how HSCs can actually transition from a quiescent to an activated state. And in part, this is we know about this because of years of work. Uh, they can sense demand from daily and stress mediated cues and then transition into this active state to differentiate into the cell types of interest in the blood and actually meet the, the needs of the, uh, the body, right? But the 
the metabolic shift, like that shift that happens of how these early steps of hematopoiesis are, you know, uh, controlled using some of these, uh, you know, metabolic pathways, it's not really well understood. And apparently it's controlled in part by the lysosome. This was the real cusp, you know, the, the crux of this paper, the lysosome, which can apparently sense nutrients and serve as a signaling center for HSCs. They are regulated by a variety of different transcription factors, including this one that they focus on here, transcription factor EB or TFEB, and also a famous one, MYC, uh, to actually regulate the catabolic and anabolic processes needed for activating uh, long-term quiescent HSCs and deciding what they're actually gonna turn into, okay? So the TFEB mediated induction of this endosomal lysosomal uh, endolysosomal pathway is triggering membrane receptor degradation, and this is limiting the metabolic activation of HSCs, and this is leading to quiescence and self renewal. Uh, on the other hand, MYC, known for its role often in cancer, right, is actually it's doing the opposite. So it's engaging these active biosynthetic processes while actually repressing the lysosomal uh, metabolism, and it's driving the activation of the HSCs, okay? So it's like a yin-yang kind of thing. And they're figuring out here that there is this dichotomy, right? There's this TFEB-mediated control of the lysosome as a way to regulate stem cell fate determination. So I like this paper because I'm, I guess I'm old school and I don't know that much about the lysosome. I do know that it is, yeah, it's kind of considered to be the, the trash can of the cell, right? But there's a lot more to it than that. It serves as a really important signaling uh, hub for HSC activity and HSC quiescence in particular. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's so exhausting, biology. There's just so <laughs> everything does something. I mean, that, it's just, there's like a thousand things and every one of them is there for a reason. How can you keep up? Um, but this is a great example of that, and I, I like that it makes sense. You know, this is one of those great feelings about when you get in science, you make an observation, you unpack a bit of the mechanism, and it all makes sense. You know, you, you solve the puzzle. John Dick does this. He's been doing it for, you know, decades in his career. Um, and, and this is another story. Uh, that, but if you're him, I guarantee you, you're just exhausted because you're like, okay, here we go. I cracked <laughs> open another nut. And I'm looking on the horizon here and I don't see an end in sight, but uh, I'm sure he gets a lot of joy out of it. Just a shout also here to Tim Schroeder on this. I love Schroeder and when it comes to, you know, the single cell and the monitoring. I'm sure he, he lent a lot to this study. Um, so, yeah, these guys, they, they're it's kind of the, the the grandfather of the blood, John Dick, and maybe the the uh, the trainees there uh, and Tim Schroeder somewhere in the middle kind of like, you know, the deputy, uh, not to, not to, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that analogy. Arun, I'm just going to kick that back to you. <laughs> right. Fair enough, man. Uh, pl plenty of esteemed dignitaries on the, the paper. How about that? Um, yeah. You talked about how it almost seems like every little cell compartment has a redundant function, like not just one function, but involved in multiple activities, right? Like the lysosome here, it's regulating HSC quiescence, right? And the thing that I actually came back to was other stories on the show that we've talked about kind of the same thing. Like the one that, that came, comes to mind is the lymphatic system and how that's actually apparently really involved in regeneration in addition to its regular functions, right? So it seems like there is a lot of redundancy in the body and I think we're just starting to figure it out. But good news, we're making jobs, right? We're making jobs for people looking for specialized roles in these fields. So, you know, it's a good thing. The questions, they just get deeper and deeper and more specific, and it's awesome. Um, another uh, deep dive here, this is a story from Mary Hutch, who was originally trained in Hans Clever's lab, and she's gone deep on the liver since her training. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story about it. This is in Cell Stem Cell, and it's, it's about the adult liver, okay, and in liver generation. We've talked about it on the show a million times, but, you know, the liver uniquely is capable of regeneration. Um, and this is governed in large part by the, the liver epithelium, right? It's comprised of the hepatocytes, right? The major guys. And then there's the biliary ducts, also called the cholangiocytes, um, that, the liver ductal cells there in the biliary ducts. Um, and the, you know, steady state, they're, they're not mitotically active, uh, but on injury or damage, you get swift proliferation 
of the epithelium in the liver. Um, and it's mostly hepatocytes that are involved in this regenerative response, but these ductal cells are also responsive to injury. Uh, and in the context of like really bad injury, you know, they do this hepatectomy, you cut off 70% of the liver and in like severe injury context, or um, when you get hepatocyte senescence, sometimes in the context of chronic injury or, or pathology, these ductal cells uh, become plastic. There's plasticity amongst the ductal cells. And, and while they're usually unipotent, um, they suddenly gain this capacity to replace some of the hepatocyte mass, right? Um, and in vitro, you can get these ductal cells from adult liver and expand them as self-renewing organoids. That's work that uh, Mary Hutch did, you know, almost a decade ago now. That was kind of her seminal finding in the Cleaver's lab that, that she built her lab on. Uh, but the, it's known that the in vivo, the, the, the regenerative capacity of the liver is not just a cell intrinsic capacity, it's dependent on this crosstalk, right, between the epithelium and the microenvironment. We talk more and more about the microenvironment, the niche, and its role in regeneration. Um, and in the liver, the contribution of the microenvironment are the niche uh, to uh, regeneration of the ductal cells is, is not really uh, described, pretty, pretty poorly understood, all right? Um, and part of that is because the systems aren't in place. You know, we're doing very well with the organoids, but to date, there hasn't been a organoid that incorporates both the ductal cells and uh, mesenchymal cells um, because the organoid models are all very epithelial centric. Right. So here, Mary and her group, they first they describe this subpopulation of periportal mesenchymal cells that are defined by PDGFRA positivity and SCA1 positivity. Um, and then they go on after identifying it to show that uh, these cells control proliferation of the ductal epithelium. Uh, and the way they do that is that the ductal epithelial proliferation is uh, either induced uh, and sustained or totally wiped out, depending on the degree to which the DCs, those ductal epithelial so the ductal cells are in, in contact with the mesenchymal cells. And it was really like a ratio thing. It showed that at a certain ratio, you get induction, sustained growth, and then at, at different ratios, you get it's totally lost. And of course, as, as many contact mediated signaling uh, processes are in development governed by notch, this too seems to have a role for not signaling. So I, I like this story because, you know, Mary always tells a good story. We got a little glimpse of this at the ISSCR. We talked about it briefly there. But this is a really nice, beautiful uh, imaging and nice mechanism to illustrate what we all knew, uh, that the, the niche has a role, uh, not just in every other organ, but also in the liver, uh, and really put, put her finger on um, what the, that function is, and that it's, it's like a numbers game, it's a load game. It's not the number of cells that are in there, it's the number of cell contacts that those cells have. So it's a kind of a novel, I think, mechanism uh, of, of how the microenvironment governs regenerative processes. Yeah, I really like the the idea of the ratio here, and it's really sensitive, actually. I, you know, you alter this ratio just by a bit, and these things entirely fall apart. So, yeah, we have to talk about organoids once on the show, right? This is our organoid paper. Uh, I did want to talk about one thing, though. They really focused in on notch signaling here, and they, I think they alluded to it, and you actually just mentioned it. There's more to it than just notch. Of course, when you're talking about these dynamics, there are multiple signaling pathways that are going to be critical for regulating this. Um, in fact, they actually mention it at the very end of their, their paper here. Detangling one of these signaling pathways from the others is a demanding but not totally unsurmountable challenge to pursue in future studies. So like we're talking about, we're making jobs, right? Or they're making jobs. Let's, let's put it at that. Um, yeah, so let's shift to the last paper of the roundup before we talk to Dr. Poss from Duke University, go Blue Devils. I think I've already said that a couple of times. Um, 
yeah, we're going to talk about VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is one of my favorite secreted proteins. And it's really critical for the angiogenic process in the, in the blood and in the blood vessels. This is a really high profile paper that's coming out in the area of aging in the field of aging. Uh, it's a science paper titled counteracting age related VEGF signaling insufficiency promotes healthy aging and extends lifespan. Wow. First author is uh, M. Grunwald, and this is coming from the lab of Dr. Keshet over in Israel at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And uh, we're talking about VEGF. We're talking about an application of VEGF for enhancing aging. So we know, of course, the body relies on blood vessels. Blood vessels control and deliver nutrients to all different tissue types in the body and oxygen and all that good stuff. And uh, unfortunately, we're all aging. All right. There's a, that's a fact of life. I know I'm definitely aging. I've accelerated my aging in the last year by a factor of, I don't know how, how much there's a lot going on in my life. All right. Let's just leave it at that. But I could certainly benefit from a way to reduce my accelerated aging and perhaps VEGF is going to be an influencing factor in that. The crux of this paper is they basically showed that VEGF is really critical during the aging process. And although VEGF production is not necessarily reduced during aging in mice, this is a mouse study, uh, they longitudinally monitored VEGF signaling, and they saw that the signaling is reduced in multiple key organs. And this is actually associated with the increased production of soluble VEGF or S-VEGF, uh, uh, veg soluble VEGF receptor, okay? Um, it's generated through an age-related shift in alternate splicing of the VEGF R mRNA, and it's functioning as a VEGF trap. Okay, so this VEGF trap is reducing the traditional VEGF signaling that's happening in uh, over the course of aging. Okay, and what they did here is they increased really straightforward experiment in my opinion. They increased the circulatory VEGF using a transgenic VEGF gain of function system or an AV associated VEGF transduction. And they maintained a quote unquote, more youthful level of VEGF signaling, providing protection from age related capillary loss, right? That, that makes sense to me. More VEGF means more capillaries and a healthier vascular tone or vascular system, I guess, more capillaries out there, right? And because of that, that led to a bunch of different aging hallmarks being altered. And again, assuming a more youthful like state, including mitochondrial function, metabolic flexibility, endothelial cell senescence, inflammation, these all became and adapted a more youthful phenotype. Uh, and on the other hand, you have to, of course, do the conversive experiment. The loss of function for VEGF, as you might expect, was uh, controlled by a, a conditional induction of the transgenic S-flit1 in endothelial cells, and it accelerated the development of the adverse aging-related phenotypes. So the VEGF-treated mice lived longer and had a longer extended health span, reduced abdominal fat accumulation, reduced liver problems, reduced muscle loss, better preservation of stronger muscles, reduced bone loss, all these good things. So, hey, VEGF, it's really important for aging, but it's not that simple, like what we were talking about before the show, Dalon, because VEGF is used for a lot of different things, right? Too much VEGF can lead to potentially cancerous phenotypes. And in fact, tumors co-opt VEGF signaling to promote angiogenesis. So it's not like we're all going to be taking VEGF pills now to live longer. It's, it's more complicated than that. But this does show the importance of VEGF, this really important growth factor in regulating aging. So a neat concept. Absolutely. VEGF pills, huh? Wow. That'll be the day. I mean, the thing is, is, as you said, very plainly, VEGF does all these things and it does, it does like the most fundamental thing, you know, the first thing, which is to, to enable mass, right? You can't have mass, you can't have three dimensions without the vessels. And that's all about VEGF, right? So I, uh, I applaud the, the insight here and concept. I don't know about translation, 
based on the idea, yeah, reduce bone loss, reduce, 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 increase tumors, maybe, I don't know. Um, and the time span that they're looking at this in mice, I don't know that they could address like long-term, if you're trying to reduce aging, you have to do it kind of chronically, right? Um, uh, but again, still very cool stuff. I don't know about delivery, if I'm, if I'm, while I'm talking, how do you deliver enough VEGF with that? No, that'd be crazy. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think that this, like another study actually that was in Science Translational Medicine just now too, talking about TGF-beta isoforms. Um, and how if you take the TGF beta, beta 2 and 3, uh, if you tweak those and not one, which is more central, then you can have a more refined response to fibrosis in this case. But I think that this is a similar thing is that, you know, you have the sledgehammer here and then it's, it's going to take some nuance to get it into therapy. And this is a first step along that path. So very exciting. No VEGF pills for me right now. Thank you very much. But uh, maybe in the near future. Uh, probably not anytime soon for me. I'm just saying, like, if think about it, right? VEGF is so critical to cancer angiogenesis. And this is, in fact, what I studied as an undergrad at Duke while I was studying angiogenesis in, in the context of endothelial cells and the importance of VEGF signaling and TGF beta signaling to, to regulate all of that. If you're taking these VEGF pills and you already have some propensity to develop cancer or some very early stage cancer, my fear is that the blood vessels and the angiogenesis in that tumor is going to skyrocket, right? Isn't that the fear? It's, it's kind of straightforward, don't you think? <laughs> Not for you, partner. Your vessels are fine. You got, you're <laughs> clean, brother. And you, you're young like a cherub. I don't know what you're talking about this past year, but I'm looking at you in the, in the screen here and you're looking fine, my friend. Don't take the veg up. You don't need it. But, uh, you know, some of you out there may need something else, some other cytokines, and I've got a message for you from stem cell technology that might be able to help you with that. Activate, expand, and differentiate your cells with cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors. From stem cell technologies, these reagents are validated to ensure reproducibility across a variety of applications for immunology and stem cell research. Explore more at www.stemcell.com slash cytokines Spoiler alert, you're not going to find any VEGF pills there, so don't bother looking. Now, let's get to this interview with our fellow Dukey, Dr. Ken Poss. All right, everybody, we are here with Dr. Ken Poss, who is professor of cell biology and head of the Duke Regeneration Center, also president of the newly founded International Society for Regenerative Biology. Dr. Poss's lab studies the regeneration of tissues like heart, appendages, and spinal cord in the zebrafish model system. His lab has established many new concepts and mechanisms of tissue regeneration, including the discovery of zebrafish heart regeneration and tissue regeneration enhanced our elements. Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's great, great to be here and chat with you guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you join us on the show, Dr. Poss, and I've been a fan of your work ever since my days as an undergrad at Duke. And in reality, your work on cardiac regeneration actually kind of served as my inspiration to actually get involved with cardiac biology in the first place. So thanks for that. Um, and before we actually dive specifically into cardiac regeneration, let's talk a little bit about the zebrafish itself, uh, which we're big fans of here on the show. And it's such a powerful model of organism to actually study regeneration. So starting at the beginning, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you actually started working with zebrafish in the first place and what you love about this system? Uh, well, um, thanks for the question. It's been, um, it's been about um, almost 25 years now uh, for me in the field of regeneration since I started my postdoc. And um, uh, at the time, um, you know, I was fascinated by the field of regeneration. It, it was not nearly as popular as it is now. And, um, you know, I was interested in using genetics in some way uh, as well. And um, uh, to, get, to, to get at a, you know, a, an important question. And, um, you know, it just, it just seemed like, you know, at the same time, zebrafish were um, coming on the scene as a, as, a, as a model system for exploring early development uh, patterning of embryos. And uh, it was clear that if one wanted to do large scale genetics in, in a vertebrate system, zebrafish were the, were the way to go. So 
kind of putting those together. Um, and maybe it's still true today. Um, if one wants to apply genetics and genetics at a large scale, including random mutagenesis screens uh, to, to regeneration, um, they are, uh, they're, they're an ideal system. And um, so, um, you know, that's, that's, how, that's how we started. So figuring out, you know, during my postdoc, which was with um, Mark Keating, starting at the uh, University of Utah, uh, whether we could really exploit, um, you know, a, a vertebrate system, some vertebrate system uh, to, uh, with genetics to understand, uh, to understand regeneration. And so we, you know, I started out studying how they regenerate fins and fin regeneration in zebrafish is, uh, it's a beautiful system. Uh, it's incredibly reliable, amputated fin over and over again, they'll regenerate essentially 100% of the time. You can do it quickly, it doesn't affect survival. And so we, we um, first started exploring regeneration using a genetic screen uh, for mutants that, that can't regenerate their fins. And um, that, that was challenging, but, but ultimately, you know, we learned a lot of perspective and understood that this could radiate out to, to other tissues like, like heart regeneration, for example. And, and um, yeah, from, from then on, essentially more and more people uh, began, you know, recognizing the power of uh, the fish and, and uh, you know, its ability to regenerate its spinal cord and heart and retina and, and, and fins and other tissues. And, and that, um, you know, there's a great chance to you know, to use genetics to, you know, to, 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 to get at this, this really important problem. Yes. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a big fan of the lower vertebrates for uh, elucidating the mysteries of developmental biology is my doctoral training was with Xenopus. I mean, not famous for genetics or regeneration, but still, I think a, a powerful system um, really because you can observe development ex utero, you know, outside of the black box that is the uterus and, and seeing really is, is, is the key to a lot of insight, you know, direct observation, but with zebrafish in particular, microscopy has been really heavily leveraged. Um, your own work uh, was among the first to use brain bow in the fish to establish a principle of clonal dominance. That was almost a decade ago. Uh, yeah. What's the latest way that your group is using tech imaging to visualize heart or other development and or regeneration? Yeah, you, you hit on something, Dale, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about and that. That is the ability to, to image regeneration, not just grossly as you know, tissues growing, but as populations of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cells you know, working in uh, some coordinated mechanism to, you know, to do something really complex and re really interesting. And so, um, so imaging regeneration at, at higher and higher resolution is, is, is really important. Um, and, and you're right, zebrafish have, have a lot of advantages of their size, some of the transparency of their, their tissues and the ability to make uh, reporter strains and, and, and just to make, make a, a, a large panel of, of transgenic animals at low cost and in a relatively small space. So um, I think that, you know, some tissues are, are a real challenge for imaging at the cellular and subcellular levels. The heart is inside a swimming animal. It's, it's constantly beating. Um, to image heart regeneration at the level we, we'd all like to is, is a challenge, but, but if you look at the surface of the fish, um, there's, there's, a, a, there's opportunities. And so fin regeneration, the regeneration of scales and of skin, uh, retina can be accessed. And so what, what I'm excited about and what we're implementing, and this is in, uh, in a close collaboration with my colleague Stefano D'Italia, also at Duke, who has an imaging and a, and a more quantitative background, certainly than I do. Um, and, and that is to, to take advantage of what molecular engineers uh, are innovating with signaling reporters or, or sensors, ways to quantify live um, in vivo in populations of cells, the activity of 
um, you know, Kainas is like Irk, um, as well as others, uh, to, to have live readouts of, of gene expression. And then, um, you know, to, to, have a, to have platforms to, to image those, uh, to capture what, again, thousands of cells are doing over a period of hours or days or weeks. And then to kind of synthesize that quantitatively and, and um, um, you know, try, try to understand what it means. And, and very recently, you know, what, what we found, just an example of something surprising, is that when we, when we pluck the scales of zebrafish, um, first of all, they grow back quickly um, within a, a week or two, a very, very robust regenerative process. And um, what we find if, if we image the osteoblasts, the main, the main cell population, the bone depositing cells, if we, if we image them with a, with a panel of reporters uh, and look at ERK signaling, for example, um, we see that this signaling pathway during regeneration has a, a really fascinating pattern of originating at high levels in the center of this regenerating scale as it kind of grows into a bigger and bigger disk. And it radiates in a, in a wave of high ERK activity across from the center to the periphery. Then another wave begins at the center again and, and radiates the periphery. And this happens six or seven times. And each of those waves is associated with a burst of growth. Mm. As the wave goes through these osteoblasts, that ring of sorts undergoes a burst of growth and then stops. And so, I, I mean, it's hard to explain these without videos and images, but mm. I think my point is that by visualizing things at higher and higher resolution. We can, we can find things we never would have expected to be involved with regeneration, like growth of a, this, these scales is, is controlled by waves of, of signaling rather than, for instance, a single source that produces a factor that diffuses mm. and controls growth um, in, a, you know, in a more traditional sense. Mm. Yeah, if a picture says a thousand words, a video says a billion, right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, honestly, that's one of the reasons I've always admired the work coming out of your lab is because this visualization, it, it you know, leaves little to the imagination, but also it boosts your imagination, right? It can serve as a source of inspiration for uh, people aspiring to do their own incredible microscopy. And as a trainee, you know, somebody who is training at Duke, this was something that I had no idea you could do, no idea you could actually visualize development in that kind of way. So it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. And for the trainees out there listening, I would really encourage you to take a look at the, the POS Labs, you know, work. It's really exceptionally beautiful imaging. Um, so let's get a little bit deeper into the cardiac regeneration side of things. You, of course, established during your postdoc that the zebrafish is a tremendous model for cardiac regeneration. And you showed that you can actually injure a significant portion of the zebrafish heart, and it's still going to grow back through division of existing myocytes. An ability that's, you know, not obviously found in adult mammals, you know, something that we're hoping to harness maybe one day down the road. And over the years, you've shown the importance of the epicardium actually to the regenerative process. And as we've talked about, you've used amazing microscopy to map out cardiac regeneration in the zebrafish. So I got to ask, you know, what's, what's next? We always talk about how one day we might be able to harness the re this regenerative capacity. Uh, for heart regeneration in humans. But what do we still have to figure out in the realm of zebrafish heart regen regeneration before we can actually translate some of these findings to, to mammals? Yeah, those are great questions. And also thanks for the, for the kind words. Um, well, the field has exploded to say the least. Um, and we you know, first started cutting pieces of hearts off zebrafish 20 years ago. And um, um, now they're, you know, they're, there are do dozens of groups, including many, many of my former trainees running labs, um, studying heart regeneration in zebrafish you know, around the world. There, there are many dozens studying other great models like neonatal mouse heart regeneration. And then e even, even many more who are, who are focused on uh, trying to, to prod and uh, the, the adult mammalian heart often in mouse models to, to produce a better regenerative response than, than it does naturally. And, and so, I mean, if, um, if you ask um, what's left to find, sometimes, sometimes you can say, you know, sometimes it's, it's, um, 
um, you know, it's 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 hard to it's hard to predict. We're, I think we're at a time where many of the the key findings we're going to back into because there's there's so much activity in the field. You know, you mentioned some of the some of the important ones. Uh, I think it's critical to have a consensus that um, heart regeneration in its natural sense, and I think most likely, I think most likely in its its translated uh, applications is about cardiomyocytes dividing. Yeah. And in fish, you know, probably it's the, it's the most um, well understood model of heart regeneration we know, and they're, they're probably the best data of any system uh, that we know, at least mm -hmm. as, as looked at in the laboratory. Uh, they stimulate cardiomyocytes to divide, muscle cells to divide, and that, that produces the, the new muscle. And in uh, adult, um, so in neonatal, neonatal mice, this is also the case. Uh, and in uh, adult mammals, it's very much, uh, you know, in my, in my view, most likely the case that we have to figure out how to get a small, very small candidate population of, of muscle cells in an injured adult mammalian heart to divide with the proclivity that, um, you know, that, that zebrafish have and that neonatal my, mice have. I think this is, this is key. This is um, a central finding to, to know the target cells and essentially to try to get them to divide and to divide better than, than what they do to produce muscle that uh, you know, could, could make a, a, a clinically relevant difference after, uh, after a heart attack or, or uh, either, either soon after it or, or long after it. Um, are, are we at the stage of, um, you know, of taking information from what we know about heart regeneration and trying to translate it. Yeah, definitely. And um, I, you know, heart regeneration versus maybe other types of regeneration like limb regeneration, uh, which is a, a real challenge. Heart regeneration, I think, I, think, I think we are there. And I think that while there's a lot to find in zebrafish still just you know, discovery biology, how do they do it and why do they do it? And especially when you get down to the level of gene expression and thousands of genes changing to enact regeneration programs, uh, you know, levels going up and down and how is that all orchestrated? I mean, there's a ton of stuff to do, but do, do we know enough now to, to, to try hard to trigger heart regeneration in mammals? And I would, I would say yes. So, uh, you know, it's an, it's an interesting time where you have uh, discovery, uh, really active uh, uh, discovery community, but, but uh, you know, even the, you know, really hardcore basic scientists like myself agree that you know I think I think we know enough to to be to be banging away in, in an informed way to, to to try to improve heart regeneration and and so you know my um uh, you know I I, I think you know it's, a, it's an interesting time for the field where you have the basic scientists and developmental biologists you have engineers you have more uh, clinic clinically oriented people coming in and 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 using the science uh, in a, in, uh, in an informed way to to try to change things, and you know, I don't know. I think I think in ten years, um, you know, we we can see um, something happening from that. This that um, you know, we we we'll, we will probably see um, you know re real real changes implemented, and we you know, it imp improved tissue repair based on you know the 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 whole of this field. Yeah, God knows we need it. Um heart regeneration is huge unmet need we've talked about it on the show a million times everybody knows it by now it's been one of the top three clinical targets for cell-based either endogenous or you know stem cell all cell-based uh, regenerative medicine it's it's been about the heart uh, i would say foremost um so you know it, it's been a long time coming and i think we've made tremendous progress but also uh, engineering approaches have quietly made uh, tremendous progress. Just a few weeks ago, a team at Duke, Duke, go Blue Devils, became the first in North America to implant this new generation artificial heart in a 39 year old. We're, we're all working toward the same goal, of course, uh, but I'm asking you, cause you're the, the endogenous cell guy. Do you think the ultimate solution will be a matter of engineering or cells uh, or alternatively you know engineering and cells yeah it could be it, it, you know it can come heart, 
heart regeneration can come from many ways. And there, there are some in, incredible groups uh, working on ways to, to create um, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of cardiomyocytes in, in culture, get them more mature, um, improve integration, and um, you know, improve the ability of, uh, of, of those cells to electrically and me mechanically couple. Uh, and, and to be taken, you know, be taken by the recipient, and and that's a, that's a that's a, a, um, you know, it's it's a, a lot of challenges there, but um, I mean, it's 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 been progressing, and it's a it's a great way to go at it, I think, versus putting in stem cells and asking them to, um, you know, to do quite a bit, um, and uh, of course, there's been a lot of controversy there. Um, there there are reprogramming approaches. Shooting in, shooting in viruses or um, cocktails of, of some sort, including drugs, to try to change the identity of, of, of cells that turn them into muscle cells. For instance, instance, the exciting idea of turning turning fibroblasts into into cardiomyocyte-like cells. I'm just it's a really exciting idea. The the big challenges there in efficiency, and then we have our, you know, again the, the approach I like the most is uh, to try to make uh, some population of muscle cells divide by um, by giving them the right signals. So there, there are big challenges there. Of course, you you want to give them the right signals in the right doses at the right times. You just certainly don't want too much of a response. And so all, all of these have challenges. And you know, you you mentioned artificial hearts uh, and engineered devices. And yeah, I I, I think everyone is acknowledges and excited is excited about those. The, those advances and it's possible they'll, they'll come together. I mean, there's, there's an exciting idea that, you know, if you take the load off the heart and you uh, provide some type of regenerative stimulus, maybe you can, you can have the best of, mm. of, of both worlds. And um, so, uh, as you said, everyone, everyone wants this to happen. And um, I don't see these as competing ideas. I, I see these as, you know, taking many different approaches to try to get, you know, try to get, I mean, first of all, to, of course, to understand the science, but also to, you know, to get, try to get, have, get less people off the transplant list and less people experiencing heart failure. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for the field. And Duke is in many ways the, at the forefront of, of a lot of this work, the basic science work, and of course, also the translational work like we talked about. It's no secret that we're fans of Duke here on the show. <laughs> of course, you know, Dalen and I both went to Duke for undergrads and Duke Medical Center actually has always been a tremendous powerhouse. And in, in some ways, as you know, Dr. Paz, it's kind of the tail that wags the dog at Duke, right? It's a world-class medical institution. So you've been at Duke for almost two decades and you've seen its evolution to be a, like a great place for regenerative medicine in particular, first through the Regeneration Next initiative that actually evolved into the Duke Regeneration Center. So you don't necessarily have to convince me and Dalon about why Duke is so awesome, but for the rest of our stem cell centric audience, why don't you tell us why Duke is a tremendous place for stem cell biology and regenerative and regenerative medicine, and what you're actually hoping to accomplish as the the new head of the Duke Regeneration Center. Yeah, well, we, you know, Duke is a great place, and Durham is a um, a, a really great place to live with a, a you know booming technology sector and a, you know low a low cost of living compared to other places. So, it, I mean, I've been here 18 years, and it's, re it's really impressive to see what's going on with. With with Durham and um, you know the folks coming here just to live here, uh, and and to work at great places like uh, like Duke and like UNC Chapel Hill, um, but the the parts have always always been here at, at Duke. I mean the the faculty here and the students here, um, you yeah, know they're impressive, and you know it's 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 been uh, you know it's been my privilege to um, to to work here. Um, I I would say that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, um, we were, um, you know, we, we, we have um, a great set of traditional departments, biochemistry, cell biology, pharmacology, and cancer biology, but um, we, we've, we've never had some formal entity that could acknowledge 
formally again, the, the importance of stem cell and regenerative biology. I think um, we had um, the people here and in particularly developmental biologists, um, people using worms and flies and mice and sea urchins and fish and, and, and mice and so on to, to understand how, how tissues form and how embryos are patterned. But, um, and then we have a great biomedical engineering um, department and school of engineering and it gets all on one, one nice campus. And then you mentioned the, 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 the clinical engine. But um, so I, the goal of Regeneration Next was just to get, get these people together and talking more about the science and uh, initially the science, you know, what, what, what are the questions in, in, in regeneration that we should be thinking about? And we framed it as tissue regeneration and not so much stem cells, although, you know, we, we all love stem cells and recognize their, their place. But we also see regeneration as kind of the ultimate goal and, um, and where we could have a particular angle because, again, I think because the base of, of developmental biologists there who, who are interested in understanding how tissue forms, whether, you know, w whether or, or, or not, say in the case of regeneration, it would involve stem cells or, or some other source. And so, um, uh, through Regeneration Next, uh, we, we had a, you know, a great source of funding from the medical school and also from the health system generally, from the chancellor to, um, to, to, to build this community. And um, it started with events to get people together, but um, I was really happy that during this time in four years, we could recruit uh, four great faculty. So essentially one per year, we could hold a search every year. And, and people came and we, we, we improved, um, I think, um, you know, we, we filled in um, some, some parts we, we, we needed uh, to, to, again, to help build and bring this community together. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the goal has been to enhance the community, to grow it, to get people thinking about and talking about regeneration. And additionally to, you know, to make this, um, a destination for this topic um, to the outside. And, you know, I've been happy to see students in our graduate program saying they, they came here because of, you know, a demonstrated focus we have on regeneration because of the programs that we have through Regeneration Next and through this new version, which is essentially the same thing, is going to carry on with the, you know, the mission. Uh, and that is the, the Duke Regeneration Center. Regeneration, you know, you're an, an uncommon guest because we're, this is such a stem cell focused show. And when we just assume that when we're talking about regeneration, everyone, their mind just goes right to like pluripotent stem cells. But I like <laughs> having you on here because you remind us that, you know, regeneration, endogenous stem cells, that's like nature's precedent. You know, nature figured all this stuff out. Uh, and we can kind of harness the system that's already working as opposed to like reinventing the wheel, ex vivo, et cetera. Um, so yes, I like, that you keep kind of steering us back to the fact that this is <laughs> your focus is on regeneration. Um, but like uh, on the other side of that, you know, as, as I said there, that, that nature's figured this out, every organ has a very complicated system that's been tweaked over eons, et cetera. So like, you know, to understand regeneration in any tissue is a whole career's worth of work. And you're internationally recognized for your seminal contributions to cardiac biology. But, you know, as we've alluded to, your work is also focused on many organ systems, the fin, bone, spinal cord, you know, what, you name it. And especially now at the Duke Regeneration Center, you're kind of all over the organ system, right? In collaborations in your own lab. So, you know, the questions left in biology have become so deep and specialized. And as I said, this career's worth of work and inquiry, there's not much left. You got to really go deep. How do you maintain such a diversity of interests and focus in the lab and produce? Like, what's the formula? What's your secret, Ken? Well, I, I think, you know, it's pretty easy. We study whatever the, the postdocs and students want to study. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm not married to any particular tissue. And certainly, as my colleagues know, uh, not to any signaling factor, gene or, or, 
or or um, you know or molecule. So um, I think that you know the best way to train postdocs, in particular, if they want to to run their own lab, first of all, is to you know support what they want to do, and often um, people want some space and they they want to start something new. Uh, so, um, and I support this, so they, they can essentially generate a, a program of their own that they can take and, they, and, they, and see 10 years of, of discoveries from. So, so it's, sometimes it's, you know, it's as easy as just saying, well, I don't want to decide what we work on. Let's, what do you want to work on? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about who else is doing that, where, where the openings are. And um, like I was saying before, for, for heart regeneration, this is a topic that where there's many, many, many labs studying it. It's moving into the applied space and there's not as many open questions in the discovery space as you said, you have to go deeper. But for other tissues, there's, there's much, I think there's much more room for spinal cord regeneration, zebrafish. There's really only a handful of labs worldwide who work on this. And I, I'm amazed by this because it's, it's one of the more spectacular events in nature when you can fully transect a, a spinal cord, cut right through it, paralyze an animal, uh, and then six weeks later, see it swimming around like nothing happened. And there, so there needs to be more people working on this. We know very little about it at the basic mechanistic level. And it's a, that's a great place, right, for a, for a, a trainee to come in, um, ask questions and, and um, start their own program that they can, they can take out. So you kind of look at, you know, it's, I kind of look at it as, as a portfolio. These tissues are at different, different levels um, in the discovery and the applied space and in, and in you know, the number of labs who are looking at them worldwide. And I think you always want to have some things that are kind of, kind of out there and no one else wants to work at them. And you know, maybe we, we try to change that situation by, by finding something interesting. Yeah, spinal cord, heart, all these different tissue types. You're a busy guy, Dr. Paz. You've got a lot of different things on your plate. You're, of course, also the head of the you know, Duke Regeneration Center. And you're also starting and are the president of a brand new International Society for Regenerative Biology, which is an organization devoted to promoting regenerative biology research and education worldwide. And uh, it's a unique society. In some ways, it fills in a gap that's really needed in this field. We, of course, have the ICCR, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, but it's pretty stem cell focused, right? So tell us about your inspiration for starting the ISRB and it's how, how it's able to distinguish itself from the ICCR and what actually you're hoping to accomplish as its first president. Yeah, well, um, I mean, first of all, there's a very fun thing. About tw 20 of us or more got together last year and, and decided um, this would be a fun thing to put put together, although, you know, at a challenging time to, to be putting anything together. So it is, it is moving forward. And I'm excited about our, our in-person gatherings that, um, you know, should happen over the next few years. Um, you know, we all have our communities that, um, you know, we, we love to hang out with and talk talk science with. And for me, it's the zebrafish community. It's you know, just a really wonderful sharing large community, uh, cardiovascular development and regeneration. Um, it's a great community. And, um, but, um, but, you know, my heart is with, um, you know, it's with regeneration, regenerative biology. And um, there are, and I, I wanna give a shout out to ISSCR uh, as well as to SDB. These are wonderful organizations that have included regenerative biology. And I'm talking about in, in all type, types of forms and flavors, animals and tissues, they've included it. But I think that, you know, there are very few um, meetings, opportunities to gather for, for those, those people who, who study, you know, how tissue regenerates in these different contexts, in planarians, in hydra, salamanders, fish, in mouse, in different tissues of mouse, skeletal muscle, liver, blood. Uh, and um, there, there's, there, there's, there's not, um, there's not a common forum for us to get together and talk about regenerative contexts, compare them, understand what's similar and, and what's different and form collaborations uh, and, and new networks. And so uh, that's, that's why we did this. And, and it's really to, again, to formalize, to formalize 
this community to bring attention to it, uh, to, to recognize the people who are, um, you know, who are, are making the big uh, uh, findings and, and who, who've, who've had, um, you know, such wonderful service over the years and provide something for the trainees. So, so um, this, this, you know, there are, I mean, we're finding out, you know, there's, a, there's an enormous community interested in how tissues regenerate, but um, we haven't had that, you know, that, that recognition in the form of a society um, where we can have tar targeted events. And so that, that's what this is for. And we'll, we'll meet regularly. We'll, um, we, we're establishing some awards, some, some career development mechanisms, some webinars. And um, you know, I'm, I'm, I am I'm excited that this is happening and really happy to be the, the first president of the, of the society. Yeah, everybody, you can look forward to that. I think the first in-person meeting is planned for 2023. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we're we're at the point now of of um, of receiving proposals for uh, for sites um, mm -hmm. and for local organizers. So um, hopefully, we'll we'll know more in a, in a couple of months. I would say where where that would be. Presumably, uh, COVID will be a distant memory. We'll be in the clear, and we can all get back together in person. I hope I, it won't take that long for us to get a chance to chat with you again, Dr. Poss. But uh, we're going to close out the formal scientific part of this interview and get to a couple of peripheral questions, if that's all right, to finish. Um, first, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, either professional or not? Well, I, th I think I think if we stick to professional, I, re I really like what my graduate advisor told me. Um, and so I was a graduate student in Susumu Tonegawa's lab, and uh, he, you know he's a titan. He he was and is. He discovered the the basis of antibody diversity, and it's always been really good at at finding and answering the big questions. Um, and he, you know what he told me is why I tell my graduate students and thinking about a postdoc and a career, and that is. Um, that is, don't think about what's interesting now or what's hot now or what everyone's doing now. Um, but, but think really hard about um, what, what people should be doing instead and, and what's going to be hot in 10 years and how you're, gonna, how you're going to impact that. And um, you know, I, I think as a postdoc in the academic field, anyway, you know, make, making the decision what field to work on and what jab, lab to join is really critical and it's even more critical than ever now just because of the sheer number of um, you know people trying to get these positions and I just thought that advice was um, you know it was it was it, it was it was really helpful to to me at the time and it, it's it's uh, advice again that I that I give to others and, and that is to try to try to look for space um, and not and, you know and not follow what what others are doing Drive the bandwagon, right? Don't jump yeah. on it. Uh, next, uh, what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to resolve? Well, um, hmm. I think that um, uh, maybe a couple of things. So, um, first of all, uh, I think that um, you know science is is thought of as uh, largely hypothesis based. And um, that um, a bit regimented in that way, in that you know, we have questions, we have our ideas of how things work, and we test them, and that's how our our labs run. But um, you know, I I, I really um, want to emphasize how important it is for there to be exploration. It's not biased. Um, not biased by questions or hypotheses. And so I, I think this is a component that, that, um, that continually needs, needs to be highlighted that you know, people who work with model systems like zebrafish have the ability to do unbiased chemical screens, to do imaging, just to look at how something happens without being biased by saying, I think this is going to happen. And um, uh, you know, it's not taught that way in school, in high school and college. But, um, um, but I, you know, I like to, to 
to promote the idea of exploration and of descriptive work where you're just watching and describing, hoping to find something new, hoping to find new questions. And, um, you know, I think that's an underappreciated uh, part of this, um, of what we do, um, to, you know, to the public and, and to granting agencies. And, you know, this, what, I mean, what this could translate into or what it should is, um, you know, mechanisms that, that give scientists more freedom, a longer run of funding and less tied to aims and hypotheses, but maybe based on their record and based on the systems they use and the excitement of the, to of the topic, just the ability to um, find new ways to explore biology uh, to find new questions for um, you know the f for the field in, in years to come. I think you're in good company there. I, one of the favorite uh, sentiments of a re previous guest we had was Hans Clevers, who said a very similar thing: is that everyone is always focused on hypothesis-driven science. Sometimes you just got to look at a thing and try and figure it out. And uh, yeah. I, I really, I appreciate that because I always feel so guilty when I'm talking to my trainees and, you know, there's this overarching question, is this just descriptive? Is it, where's the mechanism? Where's the mechanism? <laughs> you know, it's nice to hear a, a seasoned and, and, you know, high achieving uh, scientists like yourself getting back to square one for all of us, really, which is just like, look at the thing. Isn't that cool? Let's figure it out. So I love that. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks for all your sentiments and insights in this interview. This has been a really fun chat for us. Uh, we've got to come down to Duke and, and catch a game, my man. Uh, put us on, on, the, on the visiting list, please. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what kind of pool I have there, but um, uh, <laughs> definitely I, I, I'll try if you want me to. And, and... Well, we'd be happy just to visit the lab, Ken. Uh, but again, uh, we, we really genuinely appreciate your time here and sharing with our listeners. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, I really appreciate it, Dalen and Arun. Thank you. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. It was a great one. The last one before number 200. Tune in for that in a couple of weeks. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Thank you guys for listening in on this episode. I don't know if you uh, caught it, but uh, I think uh, Dr. Poss extended Arun and I an invitation to Duke. All right, so it's on the record. Hopefully in the near future, we will be broadcasting from the beautiful gardens in Durham. Until then, you're gonna have to tune in for the next episode, number 200 coming in in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us, guys. Mm -hmm.